I'm working on a game called FP Chess, which is a mix of two genres, movement shooter and chess. Chess is the core of the game and the win condition, so the mechanics are not modified in any way. You take turns making moves, you have a certain amount of time to do so, and you win by finding checkmate or if your opponent runs out of time. The catch is, you're playing on a massive chessboard, and you have to be physically near a piece to move it. So when it's your turn to make a move, your objective is simply to reach your target piece without being shot by your opponent. You'll do this by moving around the board with mechanics similar to other movement shooters. Grappling hooks, double jumps, slides, you know the type. And all this takes place on a map with tons of verticality on account of the skyscraper chess pieces. But that's just the elevator pitch, there's quite a bit more to it. For example, you can only grapple on your own pieces, so rushing into enemy territory solely in search of kills will leave you vulnerable. But I'll get more into the details in the future. Today, we'll just focus on building two foundational systems, player movement and basic chess logic. We could just say if the player hits the forward button, set their velocity to the movement speed in the forward direction. but. We're taking a different route. Some games like Overwatch, although they may have changed this in the sequel, I don't know for sure, use that sort of system where you are immediately moving at a set speed in whatever direction you're pressing the button for. This allows players who are moving left to immediately start moving right upon switching the button pressed. The alternative, what we'll be going with, is acceleration-based movement. You'll find varying implementations of this in Counter-Strike, Valorant, and a number of other games. Instead of setting the player to their full movement speed right on input, we instead gradually add to their velocity. That is, we apply acceleration. Now that the basics of movement are done, we need to grapple. The basic functionality here is easy. You shoot a projectile, make it fly until it hits something, then pull the player in the direction of the collision. That's technically a grappling hook, but it sucks. It's common practice to take into account look direction and movement input to allow the player to alter the path of their flight. Look left, swing left. Look left and hold the move left button, swing lefter. We also need a way to disconnect the grapple. Well, two ways, actually. First off, right now the player can spin circles while grappling, which looks wrong. To fix this, we need to check if the angle between the player's look vector and grapple vector is 90 degrees or more. Basically, if they look away from the grapple too much, disconnect them. But we don't want players forced to spin circles to stop grappling. We also need a manual option. If you hit the stop grapple button, stop grappling. That's simple enough, but this doesn't quite feel satisfying. Let's add a little boost on dismount, as if we're throwing ourselves off of the grapple instead of simply letting go. And finally, I know the goal is to get a rough prototype as quickly as possible to allow for playtesting, but I'm going to allow myself two small features for polish. A speedometer to show us our velocity, and speed lines that scale with that number. And this is the point in development where productivity drops off a cliff because a mechanic has become entertaining enough to procrastinate with. But alas, there is more work to be done. Implementing all the rules and intricacies of chess is quite the task. So today the goal is simple. Be able to make legal moves and only legal moves, have the moves be reflected in both the world and UI, and have a synced game state that tracks the status of the game so we can add the rest of the rules in the future. You might be wondering where one even begins here. I mean, there's no way there's an entire website dedicated solely to chess programming with decades of… oh, cool. After spending a night reading every page I could find here, the conclusion I came to was simple. These people are way smarter than me. We're talking bit boards, mailboxes, vector attacks, it goes deep. Which makes sense when you consider that to make something like Stockfish, you have to create a chess engine that is optimized to the absolute maximum. But. And here's the thing, I don't want to make stockfish. The singularity seems to be progressing just fine without my help. I just want to easily store and manipulate data that represents a chess game. For that, all we need is a simple array. An array, as you probably know, is basically just a list of things, where every thing is in a certain order with a certain number representing it. To turn a chessboard into an array, we can just give every square an index starting at zero and going up to 63. In our case, the board state array will hold 64 different items of type chess square. Chess square items contain in information about the current piece, the original piece, and of course, the index of the square it represents. The other data type we'll define is chess piece, which contains all the information about the pieces held in our squares, like their color and type. This is all just data though. To see if it translates into chess, we need to get something on the screen. My approach to this was to create a single square UI element that held all possible states. It can change its color, show a piece of any type, or show no pieces at all. That's nice to have, but when we go to spawn them, we run into an issue. Sure, we can write a loop of 64 iterations with some square color and positioning logic to spawn squares, but how do we determine what pieces go where? We could technically just code the beginning state directly into the array, if index is 0, spawn a rook, if index is 1, spawn a knight, but there are a couple of problems there. One, that's boring, and you know, that's 
Not ideal. Two, there's no flexibility. What happens if we want to start a game in a different state? We'd have to go back through and repeat the process we just followed with slightly different values. We need a simpler way to store board state. For that, we'll use fin strings. Fin strings are a way to hold an entire snapshot of a chess match in a single line of characters. This looks nonsensical at first, but it's actually pretty straightforward. Each character represents a square. A letter means the square holds a piece, R for rook, B for bishop, etc. Capital letters are white pieces, lowercase letters are black pieces, slashes signify the end of a rank or row. Numbers represent blank spaces. Whatever the number is, there are that many consecutive empty squares. So we plug the fin string for the starting state of a game in, use the logic we just discussed to turn the string into a chess square array, loop through that array to spawn the squares, and just like that, FP Chess features a customizable chess UI. Unfortunately, right when our pieces load in, we have technically reached a stalemate because we haven't added the ability to move any of them. Well, movement itself isn't a problem. Dragging a piece is just a matter of making it stick to the cursor when clicked. But when we drag them, we should only be allowed to put them down if we've made a legal move. The real puzzle to solve is determining which moves are legal. And for clarity's sake, I'm only working on moves to empty squares at the moment. Takes won't be difficult to add, but it won't be until later. This is an interesting problem with our array-based board representation. Each square has an index, starting at A1 with 0 and ending at H8 with 63, along with data regarding the piece occupying it or black thereof. So our entire solution for checking legal moves will consist of searching this array for the data we need. For example, let's say it's the first move of the game and we want to move to E4, so we click the E2 pawn. Once we click that piece, our chess engine needs to check if the square in front of it is occupied, and if not, if e4 itself is occupied. To do this using our array, we get the current index of the pawn and add 8. That gets us to the square directly ahead of the current square. If that square is empty, we can move to it, and we can also check the square ahead of it by adding 8 again. Finally, if that square is empty, then the move to e4 is legal. Knights follow similar logic. Plug in potential moves and check if there's a piece occupying it. But here we run into a bit of an issue. In terms of array indices, we can go positive or negative 6, 10, 15, 15 and 17. With a knight in the middle of the board, this all makes sense. Take 17, for example. Count up the array 17 squares and you've arrived at your destination. But what about a knight in the eighth file on the far right of the board? Count up the index 17 times and you end up allowing it to move to a square all the way over in the first file. These sorts of bugs pop up all over the place, requiring us to run some validation on each move. Knights, for example, can be validated by checking that their move hasn't changed their rank or file by more than two. Finding all legal moves for each piece without including any illegal moves is just a matter of laying the core rules and validations in this manner, then catching edge cases as they come up in testing. Now we just have to make the move. On the UI, this is simple. Remember, earlier I explained that each square has each possible state built into it, so we just need to enable the correct state when the move happens and show the right pieces. As for the physical pieces, let's make them move in stages once the piece is dropped on the UI. Stage one, move up until we've reached our move height. Stage two, move toward our destination until we are directly above it, and stage three, move down until we've reached our original height. This gradual movement system doesn't only look better, but it also allows us to grapple off pieces while they're moving. And with that system in place, we now have an extremely basic version of FP Chess. I would be remiss not to bring up the fact that this is my first ever video, so if you've made it this far, consider subscribing because there is a lot more to come. Next up, I'll be filling in gaps and polishing what we worked on today, adding guns and basic combat, and soon I'll have my sights set on multiplayer so we can finally start truly testing the game. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you next time.